how was everybody? I have a special, another special guest for you because you know that's what you come to expect when you're listening to Possibilities with Monique DeMeo. So today I have Deb Smolensky. Let me tell you a little bit about her. She is a CWP, CLP, WellCOA faculty member and a senior vice president and global practice leader of well-being and engagement. Deb is a number one best-selling author, speaker, and award-winning thought leader in the area of human performance at work. She serves as NFP's Global Wellbeing and Engagement Practice Leader and for the last 25 years has worked with hundreds of employers, including Fortune 500 companies, developing strategies, programs, and practices that empower employees and executives to lead, ready? This is right up my alley, people, healthy, productive lives at work through innovative, meaningful, and highly engaging solutions. Welcome, Deb. Thanks for having me. I am so excited. Highlight of my my month. Yay. All right. Cool. You know, I want to do a little pl- shameless plug. For those of you who are watching us on YouTube, I'm holding up Deb's book. For those of you that are listening, I'm holding up Deb's book. <laughs> it's fabulous, by the way. Check this out. Um, I just want to read really quickly so that I can get you guys engaged in the possibility that is in front of us today. I want to read the the jacket cover, which I thought was so brilliantly uh, written. Brain On is the name of Deb's book. You have access to the single most powerful technology you have ever known, your brain. And yet, as incredible as that organ inside your head is, it hasn't been upgraded since the beginning of time. Your brain is designed to keep you safe. Thank you. But it's up to you to expand your operating system to be happy and productive in the office and at home. Negativity is the default when you're not intentional about how you use your brain. This translates to overwhelm, distraction, burnout, and other work stressors. In Brain On, Deb Smolensky serves as your coach to retrain your brain through mental fitness strategies that will help you navigate ever-changing and uncertain world in which we work. And there you go. That, my friend, is the intro I wanted to give you. Yes, something I wholeheartedly have learned you know, over the years and can synthesize clearly and will stake a claim to that all day long as the number one factor. So tell us about this journey that you had and what what, what possessed you to write this book? <laughs> yeah, I never thought I would write a book, so never say never, but it's just one day, this culmination of everything I believe Everything I talk to clients about, which clients are HR and organizations in well-being space and human performance, and everything I've gone through personally on a daily basis. So give us an example of what you mean. Well, yes, synthesize this to like this computer right here. You know, if you believe your thoughts, your reality is much different. If you challenge those thoughts, that, that survival mechanism trying to keep us alive in today's possibilities open up every day change your thoughts change your world and so i kept saying this one at a time right direct to a client direct to a person direct to myself and i just finally had this motivation to i need to move faster with this knowledge i need to move faster and get it out in the world and that led it to the book so, I mean, we always hear, and I talk about this in, in my internal narratives, you know, we, we, we give meaning to things that have no meaning. We make up stories to validate our behavior. We, uh, we justify stupid decisions because then we made a story, we reverse engineered the decision or the action, and then we create a story around it to be like, yeah, but that was, you know, that was the right thing to do. No, it really wasn't. But you made a story around it. And now you think that you feel better about yourself because that's your survival mechanism to not kill yourself or whatever. And we've heard you are your thoughts. We've heard, you know, if you think 80% of our thoughts are negative, that's what I write, I wrote about. And so you're here to validate that statement. I'm here to validate really at the end of the day that that statement is normal. We just have never been taught in a way that's simplistic, which I'm all about simplicity, that how our brain works, right? Yes, you did this exact same thing with seven secrets, right? We've never been taught. So it's beyond like the 80% negativity. I truly believe 
the way work is going to get better, the way we're going to solve burnout, the way we're going to have better relationships is truly just to first understand my own wiring and nobody's telling us that. So let's unpack that for a minute because I think that's a really good jumping off point. How do you get to understand, you, you fundamentally we're all different in some way, shape or form, but how do you fundamentally understand, get grounded in your wiring? Like, I'm not a psychologist. I'm just an, you know, I'm just an executive woman listening to this podcast. And I, you know, I have good days. I have bad days. I think I'm great. I think I suck. It depends on the day. What's my wiring? How do I figure this out? Well, exactly what you wrote about. So fundamentally, we actually are all the same. It's the 1% difference, um, maybe the wiring and neurodivergent, but the wiring is the same because we're all here and breathing. Our brain's one job is to keep us safe and alive. So I always say, at the end of the day, if you were sitting in front of your brain having a performance review, brain, how did you do today? Every single day, no matter if you're hiding under your desk or throwing up papers and had the worst day ever, your brain would say, I knocked it out of the park because you are still breathing. So it's job is to understand that. So I think the way I approached this book was taking 30 year, years of me learning. I'm not clinical either. I'm just trying to make it through the best I can and help others do the same. I think our, the, our job is to all understand the fundamentals, which is what you write about, which is what I talk about, which is our brain has negative bias. It has 30 to 60,000 thoughts a day, and most are negative. And the stories we tell ourselves are a protective mechanism. If I drop my phone, I gasp. I literally have a physiological response. Well, that's normal because it thinks it's a dinosaur or, you know, something big is happening. So really it's starting with the core concepts that we're all alike and we're all running the same technology is my point. Right. So you're, you were, you're basically, uh, in al you're making an, an analogy between the upgrade to understanding it and then leveraging what you know about the brain, what it's going to do in its default state to make it, you know, a, in today's world, not having the dinosaurs chasing us or somebody eating us in the woods. So what does that, what does that upgrade look like? Yeah. So it really just starts with awareness, which sounds so basic, but awareness training is actually a practice. Checking in and knowing how we're thinking and feeling every day. So that upgrade, I spent two years just asking myself and being aware of when I'm triggered, I'm frustrated, I'm upset, running the fear-based program. And that is like the fountain of youth. It changes everything. If you're aware that, oh, I'm, I'm really shutting myself down. Like I'm talking negative to myself or that face you just made on zoom is not that you're mad. You probably have some like awareness of how the stories you're thinking and the feelings you're feeling. That is the upgrade 5.0, a thousand point oh, And the rest is kind of not gravy, but I call it foundational level two. And so literally for a whole year while writing this book, I just asked myself, am I brain off or am I brain on? Knowing that I was always brain off, knowing that threat protection, that virus protection program, like a computer is running all day long. You can't do anything when that's running, right? Say with your brain. So I just literally had to say, oh, I'm brain off. Good job, Deb, for remembering. That builds a habit. That upgrades the wiring. That sounds so simple and probably we could end your podcast there, um, but that's it. But, and so let me, let me take that as also another jumping off point. So I am aware when I'm triggered. So highly evolved human beings or people that have done deep work on themselves know when they're triggered. They may not. And so they, they may have a moment in that moment when it's happening that they say, oh shit, I'm triggered. He said something and I'm about ready to launch the nuclear, you know, launch pad. <laughs> I'm about to go to level three DEFCON 5, whatever that expression is. 
how do you, so you go into the, this techniques and strategies to prevent yourself from doing DEF CON 5. So yes, yes, because that's DEF CON 5. Like that takes a lot of practice, but I'm trying to live and survive every day. So for example, I need to know when I'm at, not even DEF CON, like I'm just not operating as myself. I, when I'm distracted, so a week ago, I found the lettuce in my chip cabinet because I used a chip clip to wrap up my lettuce and I was distracted. Like that is what I'm trying to help everybody be aware of. We are not paying attention to the present moment. DEF CON 5, like good Lord, if I get there, okay, let's go. I can help my triggers, but I am talking survival of the daily fittest. So, so, okay. So what you're basically saying is we're showing up in a default state and we are showing up, not our best selves at a regular basis. Cause we're not even aware that we're not even in, you know, turn on mode. Brain's not on brains off, you know? Okay. So let me ground it with that and say, what is the relationship you think people need to develop with their brains? Yes. That's, that's part of the exact statement I love in the book where I say, we just need to develop a different relationship with our brain, understanding it creates our, our reality moment to moment. So it's really about pausing and checking in. So the purposeful pause is an exercise, is an upgrade. Before I run out the door and I don't have my keys, how about we just take a step back on that threshold because I'm always forgetting my phone or my keys and just say, hmm, do I have everything I need, right? Am I like not running a mile a minute? So the upgrade are at micro moments of daily habits we all do, trying to connect the dots of if I'm just present and experiencing life, not like running through it brain off. Yeah, so that's funny that you say that because I talk about these, you know, micro moments make macro outcomes and a whole bunch of micro moments really have like a compounded interest effect, you know? So you make a bunch of bad little decisions, it ends up having a really bad impact on you overall. So like watch the little mini moments like you're talking about. That summarizes my whole book, not to interrupt you, but that literally summarizes my whole book because I'm trying to bring those micro moments to the work day and cover why we're burned out every day. We aren't paying attention to those micro moments. We go from an email that goes, are you kidding me right now? And we just go, and then send, and then we go on and on. Each one is a micro moment that either detracts or strengthens our energy and our day in our relationship. There you go. Perfect. So you come from a place of the brain. I come from a place of intention. Yes. So what do you think that American businesses, and you work with Fortune 500 companies all the time. You're working with, with large brands that, you know, they pride themselves on performance. And so what do, what do these companies not have right about mental health and wellness and this topic? What, what are we getting wrong here in the United States? Yeah, well, across the globe, um, I think it's the thing. And I really appreciate that answer because that's my passion and my mission. And it's not that we're doing anything wrong. We just went from a, an era where we industrially are, right? We used our physical body to create work, right to the knowledge era where we use our brains to actually create work. But we only onboarded people, built companies off of the job skills. But this now we're learning is really where the secret sauce works. This is where I decide, I communicate, I make products or I make errors, cyber events, aren't because you don't have the right technology. It's because a person was distracted and clicked on a link, right? So we actually have to start training our brains at work through L&D, through HR, through leaders to understand the human innate skills of paying attention, building our attention network, being at focus, compassion, everything you write about intention is a practice intention is a practice and so the first step is understanding now that the door has opened from the pandemic that we all have mental health issues so 
mental health though in our world is clinical anxiety depression ptsd like really significant things and 20 to 40 percent of a, a workforce is going through that and needs care and access to care and quality care at an affordable rate right that's not me though because a hundred percent of us have brains that are stressed out every day and so just knowing that mental health is different and has different solutions than mental well-being. That's it. So I want to bifurcate because I, I loved your section on knowledge worker, personally. So I wanted to dig deep into the knowledge worker that you, because that is all to your point is you're creating jobs, opportunities, commerce, all sorts of things from the brain, the knowledge, not the, you know, okay. So we'll unpack that for a moment, but I want to distinct you to have the distinction for the audience wellness, mental wellness to mental health, two different things. Let's talk about one and the other. That's exactly what's missing in corporate. And in all fairness, we didn't even focus on mental health in the workplace as much until the pandemic, right? So this is all new. And the difference is people, people are buying mental health as an umbrella, which they should. Let's really help people that need the care. But we are also, it's an and. We need to build in the skills with mental well-being. And it could be a program or a solution, but a lot of people, a lot of organizations don't have budgets, right? There's free solutions like Insight Timer. Learning and development can double down on courses around emotional intelligence, unconscious bias, time man, like all of those. Instead of a one and done, it's a one a day. It's a one a day practice. And if we move into mental well being incorporated into the people experience through all the touch points as one a day, one a meeting, we will move like needles more and more and faster and faster. I, in my foreword, I was so um, just grateful to work with Jeremy Hunter, who's the professor at the Peter Drucker School of Institute. Great forward, by the way. Uh, he's amazing, amazing. Check him out. But he helped me realize the number one statement organizations say is wrong. They say people are our best asset. Well, that is not true because we're mostly brain off, operating in fear. People are our greatest asset in organizations when they're brain on, calm, clear, connected, energized, you know, tied to the mission and purpose of a greater, you know, thing, whatever that means to them. And that is the goal. The goal is to have every single person end their work day better than they started by having micro moments of awareness and becoming brain on and managing our energy. That is the vision, my friends. That is the vision. And I can see, I know, I know a handful of people that I know listen to this religiously and they, they're thinking, oh, that's so great, Monique and Deb. You are smoking some serious ganja weed over there. I don't know where you think you work, but I work in a place that is fill in the blank, toxic. The people suck. The mission is not there. My leadership doesn't care about me. I am just, you know, trying to survive, not get killed in a corporate bullshit. I can hear these voices inside my head right now. Thank you all. I won't name you, but you know who you are. And they're listening to you go all these micro moments at the end of the day, you're going to feel better in the beginning. And they're like, bullshit. I'm calling you, Deb. Yeah, I'm calling you out. Yeah, yeah. But every, every one of those things, I'll, all I'm trying to say and what will work is challenging that each one of those stories our brain is telling us. That's it. Awareness training of your thoughts. Because even if I'm in a toxic workplace, I have choice to step outside and find a freaking tree to like hug. I have a choice to take three deep breaths and just protect my... Yes, yes, yes. So... You can think I'm smoking ganja, but I'm here to say I've made my way through this every day working on my brain and still do. So there is choice in everything and there is challenge 
about really thinking the stories we're telling ourselves. So wait, so you get, you get into this moment, you know, that this is your brains off your, your boss, your client, whomever just says something complete crazy stuff. And you know, we go into the cyber tooth tiger is about to eat me and oh, triggered. And now it's like fight or flight. We know what happens. Those of us who have done training, we know what happens. It's the, you know, the, the limbic brain kicks in, blah, 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 blah. Okay. What do you do in real life? Clearly, he's not a cyber to the tiger. Clearly, the boardroom that you're sitting in in this presentation is not the jungle. What are we doing? Yeah, so that's where I go on through just micro exercises, easy exercises. You would think it's like really complex. It's not. The breath triggers us brain on, right? So you won't even tell. I might be like hearing this stuff and I'm like, oh my gosh, I am breathing. I'm looking down so I don't see things. I'm just like window shades. So I'm just going internal and I'm just like holding my pen and I'm breathing three deep breaths. The first breath, I'm releasing that thought or that story. The second breath, I am releasing that shoulder because I'm going to war right now. And that third breath, I'm bringing to mind somebody that makes me smile that I love and I'm wishing them well. I'm like, I hope you're having a great day. And and I do that over and over because that person is just sending toxicity and turning my brain off all the time. This only lasts as long as the, the conversation is lasting. So it's, it's micro moments. Or if it's really bad, please don't stay in that toxic conversation. Time out. I think I just, you know, things are getting a little heated. But we have to be aware to pause. We're in it. We're like at the battleground. And so practicing, practicing your threshold, I'll be back in a second. Okay. Like these things are so simple, but so hard to do because of our programming. It's really funny you say that because I just talked about, um, I just did a solo episode taping the other day about owning our shit. And it, it was, the conversation was triggered by a conversation we had here where you know, one of my, um, one of my team members uh, had a moment where we were on her on something because it was, we thought we were being hacked. Oh yeah. You were in fear brain so bad. I mean like, okay, now there's somebody in my social accounts. There's some, go, no, no, this is what happened, right? This is what, and, and it was, it was time sensitive because we had to get a podcast up and we couldn't get into our accounts, the whole thing. And, um, long story short, she was three hours behind. So like, you know, my, my director of marketing and I are like, you know, sending her texts and she's totally overwhelmed and totally triggered, but we don't know that we think she's avoiding us. And we're, and I'm like, call me. And I'm like, call me capital letters, call me. And cause I'm like, in, I'm in resolution mode. I'm like, you need to call me right now. Cause I don't often do that. And when I say, call me, like, I expect you to call me. So she did it and she's answering my texts and I'm like, mm -mm, no, this to me, I, I, my story is you're avoiding me because if you have the time to respond to me, you're there and you're on your phone, then you can pick it up and dial or click whatever. So I said, you, you know, I'd like to talk to you about, you know, what happened. It turned out it wasn't hack. It was actually, it was actually her. So there was a problem. I don't have a problem if you make a mistake. I want you to own the mistake, apologize for it, make it right, and move on. I have no issue with that. When you hide and you create a story around it, now I have a problem. So I get her on the phone and she's like, well, you know, I've, I was triggered and you know that I have some, you know, issues and da 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 And I felt like I couldn't breathe and I was starting to hyperventilate and blah, 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 blah. And I said to her, what you needed to do is say, we are not hacked because it's me, period. I need to step away. I will be back to you in five minutes. Hold the phone. Okay. I would have, that's acknowledgement, ownership, moving on, conclusion. Everybody's blood pressure is down. You own your response, but you tell me how you want to handle it. Without that information, I am making up a story that you're avoiding me. Well, I'm not really making up a story. You're not talking to me. So therefore there's no resolution. So as your boss, I'm, I have certain expectations 
you have a challenge that you you're feeling like you're being, you know, like you just woke up, you checked your phone and now it's blowing up and okay, I get that you're confronted, but you need to help me understand how to handle you. Yeah. And that's a sign of a good leader that you just did. That conversation's beautiful. I mean, you're very evolved, right? The problem is the leader stops at call me and picks up the phone or the text still at that call me level without. So I have a whole chapter on managing the other brains. As a leader, it's very hard, but we need extra practice and extra rewiring. And that person, because of the feedback, which is a gift, she might spiral for a good day or two, which puts your organization at risk while she's spiraling. And so the training on difficult conversations, conflict resolution, breathing through, becoming clear, just knowing if your brain off or brain on is that's why I go back to the fundamental of how organizations are going to be successful moving forward. Yeah. Well, I believe that what, you know, I, I, my training was what, what you, what does not get communicated controls your relationship. So if you don't come forward and look, if it's the same thing in a marriage, in a relationship with your kids, a relationship with, with people in your workforce, your friends, what you have happening in the back of your brain. And in, and now we're learning more about how our brains work. Thank you, Deb. To me, it's, that's, what's going to drive your relationship because you're always going to have that thing. Like I have a thing right now with my mother, I need to unpack her, for her that she's confronted by what's happening in her life. And she has a preconceived idea that, you know, people are, you know, not being forthright with her and she's entitled to things. My mother's very entitled. I don't know why, but she is. Um, so I have to unpack the fact that she is entitled for the wrong reasons. And I have to unpack the fact that she has preconceived ideas about what she should and should be not, uh, you know, able to do based on her circumstance. She's smoking dope, right? So like, I'm like, you know what? Let me give you a little dose of reality. This is how we're going to do it. I have to do it in a way that kind of unpacks it for her and, and she can hear it. But so I think this takes practice in the corporation. I feel that people, you know, you have to create space for that. I don't think they do that. So they bring you in to help them create space for that. Yeah. Listen, there's a whole other like year long podcast on how we help organizations design and develop policies, procedures, environments on that space and on that training, because burnout is just not a one way blame me, but we have a choice and it's important to know if we rewire, we won't, we need to take care of ourselves, but also the organization plays a huge part, which is why I dedicated the last three chapters into building a mentally strong organization. So I think around, around the, the topic of intention and, you know, designing your, your reality, there's neuroplasticity, which is one of my favorite topics in the world. I love, um, I, I read Joe Dispenza all the time. And so I love, I love his, so yeah, he's awesome. So I want you to explain neuroplasticity how it relates to our conversation for the lay person that's like, what? Yeah. So that's why I'm not clinical. And I claim that like, I view it as just building new muscles. Um, in essence, everything we do lays new muscles down in our brain. That's neuroplasticity. Our brain just learns new ways to connect dots. But if you go to the gym, and you lift weights the wrong way, you have pain and suffering, right? If you think the wrong thought, well, we are programmed to think the wrong thought. So we are already injured in a way, right? Layman's term. And, but neuroplasticity allows us to build healthy muscles if we train it the right way and allows us to thrive just as if we lift weights the right way these exercises rewire our muscles in our brain, which again, it's not muscles. Please don't email me that. But that's how I think of it, right? We have the chance to really develop healthy thoughts, healthy emotions, um, and work with what our programming is so it's upgraded during the day, during our life. It's just the problem with neuroplasticity and any health change or behavior changes, we can see our muscles getting stronger and the shape of our body changing. 
we really can't see our, our brain muscles getting healthy and strong until you practice over and over and an event might come up that's traumatic and you handle it in a better, healthier way or a calm way. Or you have the same meeting every day that used to just tick you off when you see it even on your calendar. And now you approach it with a different understanding and a different resiliency. That's, that's how the muscle looks. Does that make sense, you think? I think it would. I think it, you know, what you're describing is the opportunity for us to use choice and intention to rewire the brain in a way that's healthy for our lives. And the only way that we're going to see the outcomes of that is in our actions, our reactions, and our in our state of being. So if you have more, it, I think it's if you look at the glass is half full versus the glass is half empty, that's a choice. It's the same glass, it's the same water another analogy. Um, so I believe that, you know, what you're describing is the sort of the institutionalization of knowledge to allow for large amounts of people to get their glasses half full. Yes. Actually skills, like you can read my book and your life won't change. Honestly. Um, you only work your muscles. Oh yeah. Or you work your muscles and you practice because happiness is a skill. It's a choice. It's a skill. It's a choice. It's a choice. It's a damn choice. Yeah. Well, and you can actually look for things to make you even happier in your life, but you have to look, you have to seek it out. It, it, it needs to be a practice and an intention, productivity, focus. I'm not going to multitask today. I'm actually going to really get something done. It's a skill. Yeah, it absolutely is. So uh, my, so my favorite quote, and I sign most of the books that I sign with this quote, and it says, anything is possible with a little intention, planning, and action. And I put the word action in capital letters. So look, you can have all the thoughts in the world. I love people who are like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about that. I'm like, you're still thinking about that, huh? <laughs> That's good. I'm thinking about going to the moon. Yeah. Great. Fabulous. So, you know, without, without action, nothing happens. So, right. So now we're here and we're deciding that what if this person reads your book, actually takes the time to do the exercises and get that muscle memory, that brain memory on, and they're, they're feeling better. They're doing their work. And multitasking is overrated. And the older I get, the more I realize that that is true. And I'll tell you a funny story in a second. So yes, multitasking is overrated people because you're doing everything half-assed or half-brained in your case. Yeah. You're, you're monotasking actually going back and forth really fast. Like let's just burn our brain out. Like, so the, the person's reading Deb's book. They're like, yeah, this is exciting. I'm doing it. I'm doing my exercise. I'm really learning. I'm, I'm on it. I go into work and they're all Neanderthals. They're all Neanderthals. Okay. They haven't done shit work. They're just, they're just not up to snuff. We are dealing with Neanderthals. What do you tell that person? So I tell that person, just be aware. All you have to do is for your benefit, be aware of when you didn't get triggered and you used to, because that's a reward for your brain. And it will really cement that new neural pathway. So when somebody comes up to you and bumps you or whatever, like, or talks over you, you're immediately going to go, oh, that's just how our brain works. But if you go, and then you're back in the game, that is showing that you really are practicing and it works. You honestly, in the real world, in the workplace, you're also looking for how far you've come every day by not reacting or noticing faster. You know, Daniel Goleman, who is the emotional intelligence godfather, right? I had a chance to talk with him and ask him a question. And I said, how do you communicate in an email emotionally intelligently? And he said two things, which apply to this question. He said, you know, there's this quote by Viktor Frankl about, you know, the space between a stimulus, a bump, an email, and the response, er, or oh. And the larger the space and be, the, the seconds between that, the larger the space defines your maturity. 
if you go off the handle, you need some brain training. Let's get back to it. But if you take just three seconds and get angry first, because that's normal, but then come back to that Neanderthal action that you just encountered, brain on calm, which is joy or calm, or just like neutral brain on, not fight or flight, that is how you learn and rewire and approve and reward your brain and will ultimately win that meeting or that email. And it just keeps going like that. Love it. There is the practical advice. Wonderful. I love, love, love that. So it's not the passive aggressive. What I was going to say. <laughs> right. Which makes everybody cr like that's normal. All who giving your sick grace, like your brain is going to go at it. Right. Okay. Let's go. It's so simple again, but it's really the, the breath, that pause, that one second choice to reframe. It might take you a day to get over that meeting. It still does for me. Let's be clear because our brain is so wired. I can go to sleep angry and I could practice my square breath and I have half a chance of falling asleep some night. That's just the way our brain works. This is a lifelong journey, but we have to, if we want to improve just our, our daily world and our daily life. Okay, good. For those of you who don't know what square breaths are, do you do five or eight? So I actually just start with Four. So square breath came from the military and it's really so beneficial for PTSD because the breath is that trigger to brain on. So I do four, hold your breath for four, exhale for four, hold that exhale for four. So your breath makes a square. And, and the thing with the square breath versus that three breath that I just went through earlier is that's when you are, your body's in fight or flight and you can't stop ruminating or you can't stop thinking about the conversation or you can't fall asleep. So the square breath, it really takes me 15 to 20 cycles if I'm lucky at night to calm my brain down. It's, it's replacing counting sheep, if you will, right? It's the modern day way. There you go. It's the Deb Smolensky way. So Deb, let's conclude with the, my favorite question, which is what would you tell your 30-year-old self? All your questions have been fabulous, by the way. You are just amazing to talk with. This has been so fun. Um, I would tell my, mm, so I'm aware that I have an emotion attached to this, right? So did you see? And so now if I don't come back, I can't articulate it. I'll just start. I would tell my 30-year-old self that, you did the best you can raising your kids, being a work warrior, 30 hour, you know, a day consultant and brain off all the time. And you learned that you can control your life and look at you now, right? The breath, the mindfulness, training your brain has so many benefits. So the don't look back, we're doing just fine. And you did the best you could at the time. Thank you so much, Deb Smolensky. That was really quite, that was a masterclass. Thank you very, very much. Listen, guys, you need to um, remember to subscribe and to follow, uh, send us some feedback on what you're listening to and how you enjoy it. The blog is on my website, which will be, uh, which is already posted, moniquedemayo.com. We're going to be sending out a newsletter. We're going to be summarizing Deb's uh, talk in the blog as well as in the newsletter. So look for that. Give us feedback and uh, pick up Brain On by Deb Smolensky. Here you go. Thank you so much. Have a great day. No, people. Make it a great day. It's a choice. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening to Possibilities with Monique DeMeo, where we unpack life as a female mover and shaker. If you like the show, please consider liking it or better still, subscribing to it and leaving us a rating. It truly does help. Also, you can pick up my book, The Seven Secrets to Creating a Life You Love, a practical guide for women in leadership. You can find the book, other episodes of this podcast, and how to stay in touch at moniquedemayo.com. D-E-M-A-I-O. I look forward to seeing you again soon. With gratitude, Monique.